Let's go over exceptions and the try statement in Python. Exceptions is a rather difficult topic. I remember first tackling it when I was learning C++. It took me quite a while to really understand what was going on. First, let's talk about what an exception is. An exception is any code path or anything that happens in the code that's exceptional, or you might think of it as abnormal. And it really depends on what you mean by abnormal. At the very least, it means that executing the code normally doesn't make any sense anymore. A good example of this is when you divide by zero. There's no sense in continuing the formula because dividing by zero makes no sense. On the other hand, an exception could be quite typical behavior. For instance, let's say you're looking for a particular value in a sequence. You raise an exception if that value is not with the value you're looking for, or you don't raise an exception if it is. When the code continues normally, that means you found the value. Let's talk about the call stack and what happens when an exception is raised. I'm going to have some sample code here that's rather ridiculous, but it should illustrate what, what's going on. So we have three functions. A of n is going to return b of n. b of n is going to return a of n. And c of n is going to return 1 divided by n. If I were to call a of n with, let's say, like a value like 5, then it would call b5, and b of 5 would call, oh, this is supposed to be c of n. b of 5 would call c of n, and then c of n would return 1 fifth. What if I were to call it with a of 0? Well, a would call b, b would call c, and then c would have a 0 division error. The call stack tells us which functions are calling which and where to go after we return. So we would have the top level code. It's calling a of 0 and trying to find the result. Then it calls a, and it is calling b of n and trying to return that result. That's calling b, which is calling c of n and trying to return that result. And then c is trying to return 1 divided by n. And this is where the exception is raised. By raised, we mean the exception travels up the call stack until some code can catch and handle that exception. In this case, there's no try blocks, there's no accept blocks, and so the top level code will get the exception and then pass it up to the Python interpreter. And the Python interpreter will print for you on the console a nice error message explaining what happened. I encourage you to run this code and see what happens and get to understand what the stack trace and what the exception means. Let's say we modified, it, modified the code slightly. We're going to define b to use the try statement to call c of n. If it sees a zero division error, it's going to return 37 instead. Okay. What this code means is that we're going to try to run the code inside the try block. If an exception is raised, then we're going to try to handle it, but only if it's a zero division error. And when we handle it, we're going to substitute new behavior instead of that. With this new call stack, what's going to happen is the following. So we have the top level code. It's calling A of zero. A is calling B of zero. B is calling C of zero, but it's going to handle the zero division error And then C is going to divide 1 by 0. When it divides by 0, it raises a 0 division error. It looks at the frame directly ahead of it, on top of it, and it sees that there's a handler for the 0 division error. The 0 division error says return 37 instead. So instead of raising the exception higher, it's going to return 37. So the result of B is 37, and so A of 0 is going to return 37. Hopefully this illustrates how exceptions work and what's going on with exceptions. If you have any questions or if this is confusing at all, please let me know in the comments below or join me on Discord. There's a link in the description. Suppose we didn't have exceptions in our programming language. How could we implement similar behavior? Well, let's write out A. This is going to call and return a value, but we really don't know what to do. So let's think about this. So when A calls another function, let's, say, let's suppose A calls B. B could return some kind of error 
or it could return some normal value. In order to represent this, we're going to have the functions return a pair of values, the first value being the error, and the second value being the normal return value, the result. So A has to call B. So we have error, comma result, is equal to B of N. Okay. Now we need to check to see if there's an error. If there's an error, A doesn't do anything with that error, it just passes it up the chain. Return the error and some dummy result value, let's say zero. Otherwise, if there's no error, we'll just return none and whatever that result is. You can see here that it doesn't really do anything with the value, so we can just substitute all this code for return b of n. But we need to remember that a of n isn't returning a single value, it's returning a pair of values. What about b of n? What is that doing? Well, it's going to get the error result is equal to whatever c of n gives it. If there's an error, and if that error is a division error, this line of code is definitely not Python, it's just pseudocode, fake code to get the idea across. Then we're going to return no error and number 37 instead. Otherwise, we'll just return the error as normal. And if there's no error at all, then we'll just return the error and the result. We could have removed this line of code and this line of code and just dedent this. If there's an error and that error is a zero division error, then return that instead. Otherwise, run this line of code. C of n, um, let's, retire, let's define C of n. How would you raise in an error in this case? Well, we're going to say if n is equal to zero, then we're going to return the zero division error. I'm just going to do ZDE for the zero division error and some dummy value, maybe zero. Else, we're going to return no error and one divided by n. A lot of this code is boilerplate code, and if you're in a language like C that doesn't have exception handling, you'll see that you're writing this code again and again and again. Compare this to this code here. So much simpler. The return value, you don't have to worry about error codes. And if you want to handle the exception, you can write special code for that. That's rather simple to see. What about a special case? Let's say you had a function where you call the function and it returns a value that is a function and you want to call that function, and then you want to call that function, and you want to call that function. We call this function chaining. So named because you're chaining the functions together into a long continuous series of calls. If we're using the scheme that we just explored where we didn't have exceptions, then writing this code is impossible. I'd have to check every single function to see if it had an error. Also, if I wanted to use functions inside of an expression, let's say I wanted to say a plus b, this kind of thing is also impossible with the uh, alternative uh, exception scheme. The reason why is I have to check the result of A and check the result of B, make sure there's no errors, and then I can add the results. As you can see, it's a lot simpler to have exceptions in your code than to not have exceptions. How do we raise exceptions? Typically, exceptions occur when you're calling code that has in it a check to make sure that nothing goes wrong and it raises its own exception. But you can raise your own exceptions from your own code. The way we do that is we use the raise statement. The raise statement can take an exception type or it can take an expression that gives you an exception type. For instance, you might say value error and then say like n is equal to zero. If the value that you pass into the raise expression is not an exception, is not derived from the exception type, then Python won't like that. It'll tell you that that's the wrong type. Well, let's look at the try statement. The try statement starts with the try suite. 
or block. Remember, a suite in Python can be a single line with statements separated by semicolons, or it can be indented by four spaces with statements stacked on top of each other. Either way is OK, but you must choose one. In the try suite, optionally, you can have accept blocks. And these have their own suite. You can have as many of these as you want. If you have an accept block, then you can also have an else block that has its own suite. And you may also have a finally block. You must have at least one accept block or a finally block. And you can't have an else block unless you have an accept block. I'm going to briefly cover what the try statement does. First, the try statement runs the suite until either an exception is raised, a return statement is hit, or the code completes. If an exception is raised and there's one or more accept blocks, then it compares the exception with the accept blocks until it find ones, finds one that matches. If it finds one that matches, it runs that suite. And that suite itself could raise an exception, it could return a value, or it could just execute completely, normally. If there was no exception in the try suite, then the else block is, qual is called. Again, the suite inside the else block can return, it can raise an exception, or just complete normally. No matter what happens, when the, all the try and accept and else blocks are completed, the finally block is always called. So whether you return or raise an exception in this code, or just complete normally, the finally block will be called. The finally block, note that if it returns or raises its own exception, then the return value that came from the try, the try suite or the accept suite or the else suite is lost. The finally uh, return statement re substitutes that. Also, if there was an exception being raised, then you raise an exception or return here, that exception is lost. It's highly discouraged to return or raise an exception from a finally block, but you can do it if you really want to. Let's talk about how the accept syntax works. There's three forms of the accept syntax. The first one is accept with no parameters, accept with a single expression, and then accept with an expression, and the keyword as, followed by some identifier. This identifier is a variable name. The expression that's inside of an, uh, the accept line can be a single exception type or a list of exception types separated by commas surrounded by parentheses. When the try suite raises an exception, each of the accept blocks are compared one after the other. If the exception is of the exception type or one of the exception types listed in this list, then that accept block is run and none of the others are run. Even if the accept suite raises an exception, the subsequent accept blocks are not run. If you would like to use accept with no parameters, this has to be the last accept block. And what this does is it'll catch all exceptions, no matter the type. Note that when you use the as identifier method, the identifier will be set to the exception that was raised. When the accept block is completed, however, that identifier is deleted. This prevents a lot of problems that can happen if you leave around references to frames. As a rule of thumb, don't catch exceptions unless you intend to handle them. If you happen to catch an exception, but it's one that you don't intend to do anything with, you can re-raise that exception with the statement raise. Note that there's no exception type and no expression here. This will re-raise the exception from an accept block. You could also call raise with the same kind of exception type or exception value, and then say from and another exception. What this will do is create a new exception that's chained to the previous exception and raise that exception instead. I discourage chaining exceptions. It's kind of annoying to have an exception with like 30 exceptions that are chained to it. So if you don't need to do it, don't bother doing it. If you want more information about the exception in the accept block, you can look at the traceback module. There's also sys.exe.info, but I discourage using this. It's fairly powerful and can cause problems. Did I mention the else block? If you have accept blocks and an else block, and the try suite did not raise any exceptions, then the else block will be called. What do we use the finally statement for? Sometimes we need to deallocate resources 
like unlock a lock in memory or write a file to disk or behavior like that. And it needs to happen whether or not an exception is raised. You can also use a with statement to replicate this feature. Typically, I don't use finally statements. I try to rewrite it as a with statement. Python has built in several exception types. You've already seen many of them. Let's talk about the ones we've seen so far. There's syntax error. This is raised when your code doesn't make any sense to Python. There's zero division error, which we've talked about at the start of this lecture. There's name error. This is raised if you try to access a variable before defining it. There's unbound local error. It's an exotic error. It's raised when you try to assign to a variable that is in the global or non-local namespace and you didn't use the global or non-local uh, statements to declare that. You may have seen a keyboard error. You get this when you're running Python code and hit Control C. If you've tried to import a module unsuccessfully, you would see an import error. Either the module doesn't exist or the module is broken. If you write a recursive function and it calls itself too many times, you get a recursion error. There's an R in there. You get a type error if you pass in the wrong number or wrong type of arguments into a function. And you get a value error if it's the right type but the wrong value. There's also the catch-all exception. Which exception type should you use? Typically, I either use value error or the exception type. The value error is for when I have a function and I don't like the values that were passed in. And the exception is for pretty much all the other cases. When we cover object-oriented programming, you'll see how you can write your own exceptions. It's rather easy to do. Let's rewrite the factorial and Fibonacci functions to take advantage of exceptions. In our factorial function, we note that it takes a value n. That n can be anything in Python. The first line of code we should run is converting that n to an integer. If n was a float, then this would do the rounding off or whatever needs to be done. But if n were complex, this would raise an exception of its own, saying that n is an invalid value. This is a fairly typical pattern in Python. You don't check the value and raise exceptions. You try to convert it to the value you'd like, and if that converter can't do it, then you raise an exception. In this particular case for factorial, if n is less than zero, it doesn't make any sense to run the code. So we'll raise a value error. Otherwise, the code would continue as normal. We'd put the exact same code in front of Fibonacci because the same rules apply. n must be an integer. And if n is less than 0, it doesn't make any sense. Typically, when you write a function, the first few lines are devoted to converting the, the values to the right types and to raise exceptions if the values are values you don't like. Some people like to use the assert statement. I disagree with this. Assert statements belong in unit tests, not in production code. I hope you enjoyed this lecture on exceptions. If you have any questions, please ask below. I know this is a fairly complicated topic. It, it can be confusing for beginners, and I do want to help beginners understand this material. I hope you have a great day. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you for watching this video on the theory of Python by Real Physics. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell, like and share this video. You can find me on Discord or support me on Patreon. Links are in the description below. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.